Corinthians and chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. <coughs> commit to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> okay, let's, let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for this opportunity to gather together. We thank you that you've given us life and breath, Lord. We thank you for the precious word of God. And Lord, we pray that you'll be our teacher this day. You'll open your word to us, give us something of understanding in the ways of God. Father, we want to thank you for the young ones, Lord. We do cover them for you, Lord. We pray that you'll work in their hearts and lives, Lord, that the word of God would dwell richly in them. Father, we again commit to you those not with us. Father, we want to commit to you as well the, the whole matter of uh, this aid to Ukraine. Father, we're asking that your hand will be upon all the, all the different bits and pieces, Lord, which way beyond our understanding, but you're sovereign and nothing is too difficult for you. So, Lord, just oversee the whole thing, we pray, and bless it, Lord, that you might receive honour and glory that mm -hmm. brothers and sisters in Christ might be encouraged mm -hmm. Lord that God cares mm -hmm. through his people mm -hmm. so Lord bless your word to us this day we pray in Jesus name Amen, Amen. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 1. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Mm. But I'm afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom, you've not, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you've not accepted, you bear this beautifully. As we were thinking a little bit, <coughs> Um, I don't sure if that a couple of weeks ago perhaps the things that we need to see in the last days the important things that we need to consider one of them is that Jesus warned very clearly very specifically that we should not be deceived we should not be misled we shouldn't be led astray mm. and that there will be a proliferation of false prophets, false teachers in the last days. And the warning for us all is that we should watch, that we should not be misled. And I want us to think a little bit about that this morning. <clears throat> How does the evil one lead astray the people of God. How does the evil one deceive the church of God? And I want you to see that there is a pattern 
there, there are certain things that we can watch out for and we can see unfold even before our very eyes. And this scripture, Paul is saying that he's, he's jealous over these believers. They're far from perfect. They've put up with the most awful immorality. He's had to rebuke them strongly to deal with certain things that it's a, it, it's a crazy charismatic kind of thing. And they've got factions, they're following after this teacher and that teacher. And there's nothing new under the sun. And he's saying that he's jealous for them. He, he doesn't want them to be led astray from the simplicity of devotion to Jesus Christ. There is a simplicity, dear friends, in our faith. There is a simplicity about being a Christian. It is to be devoted to Jesus Christ, to walk with him, to talk with him, along that narrow way, to walk in obedience, to listen to him, to love him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, and to trust him in everything, implicitly. It's a personal relationship as a child of God, our good shepherd, who laid down his life for us, will lead us, will watch over us. We can walk with him and we can talk with him on that narrow way. And we need to keep that devotion to Jesus. <clears throat> but Paul warns here of being led astray. And he says that the serpent <coughs> deceived Eve. The serpent deceived Eve and this is a warning for us that we can be deceived, we can be led astray, we can be misled. The evil one wants to mislead us. And I want us to see that there are certain principles laid out for us that we dare not depart from or we should not depart from so that we're not misled so that the church does not go into false teaching because where does it end up? Another Jesus another spirit another gospel mm -hmm. The first thing I want us to notice is that there is an assumption here by the Apostle Paul <clears throat> that the believers not only recognize the book of Genesis but accept it as simple truth. Just as the serpent deceived Eve. You remember the account in the book of Genesis. Was it a literal garden? Was it a literal Adam and a literal Eve? And was the woman deceived by a serpent? Paul's just mentioning that to these believers, <coughs> assuming that they are just simply going to accept and they realize that the book of Genesis was the simple truth, literally as it is written. It's a book of beginnings. Mm. Whenever something is found in the book of Genesis as, a, as a, the first appearance in Scripture, there is great significance. How do we know that? Well, how did Jesus answer certain things? When he was challenged about divorce, and what did he say? It was not so... In the beginning. In the beginning. In the beginning, dear friends, is 
the title of the first book of the Bible. The first book of Moses. The beginning of the Pentateuch, the, the, the law of God. In the beginning. It was not so. In the beginning. The book of Genesis <coughs> is absolutely key and essential to the whole doctrine of God. The beginnings laid out for us in the scriptures. Did Jesus accept them literally? Absolutely. 100%. Did Paul? Absolutely. 100%. Should we? Yes. Absolutely. 100%. I'm thankful for ministries like um, Answers in Genesis. Mm. And, I, and I'm not seeking to criticise any of the creation ministries, but one of the things that they tend to say is, there it is, Genesis 1 to 11. There it is, Genesis 1 to 11. We need to accept these things. It's all there. Genesis 1 to 11. But dear friends, there's not just 11 chapters in Genesis. No. No. <laughs> it doesn't stop there. No. They're avoiding potential controversy. Why? Because in chapter 12, what, do we, what have we got? We've got the covenant to Abraham. And they, they don't want to get down that territory. God's promises to the father Abraham of a nation and a land as an everlasting covenant from God to Abraham and his descendants. They want to pick out that the seed of Abraham will come as a blessing to all the nations, but... They want to avoid the controversy of God's purposes for Israel and the land of Israel. Sad, really. But we need to accept the whole book of Genesis. I believe that no man should be in the pulpit who does not. Accept the word of God as it is written from Genesis chapter 1 right through to Revelation chapter 21. No man should be in the pulpit who has any problems with accepting God for what he says. And the first stage of deception is when we have people in the pulpit who do not believe the word of God literally. Do not accept it as it is written. They don't believe in a six day creation. They don't believe in any of it. They don't believe in a flood. They, they, they don't accept the story of the Tower of Babel. They, 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 they don't take any of these things literally as they are written. And what does that do? It opens a door, dear friends. It opens a door for the church of God to be deceived. Why do we have no clear teaching on sexual morality in these days? Why? Where's the root? Well, Jesus said in the beginning God made us yeah. male and female and for this reason, a man shall Please. leave his father and mother and shall Please. cleave to his wife and the two shall become Please. one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man separate. Anything outside of that, dear friends? It's sin. <coughs> Why do we have no clear teaching <coughs> on marriage? And divorce? Why do we have no clear teaching on abortion and the sanctity of human life? Because we have people in the pulpits, dear friends, who do not accept the book of Genesis as the true word of God. 
Where do we get the sanctity of life? Where do we get capital punishment? The book of Genesis, dear friends. Human life is sacred because what? We are made in the image of God. How can we take the lives of innocent babies in their mother's womb? When we accept that they are made in the image of God. What is that? Well, the Bible calls it murder. Well, that's uncomfortable. In this day and generation and culture, you can't say that. Well, I can't say that unless I believe the Word of God, dear friends. Unless I know that I'm standing firmly on something which is established by God, revealed to us by God, and it's not my opinion, it is simply what God has said. Why do we have racism? Well, it comes because we're not accepting the book of Genesis, dear friends. How many races are there? One. The human race. There's one. Adam's race. And what a miserable race it is. Rotten sinners in rebellion against God. All of them. Doesn't matter what shape, size, colour, or anything else, dear friends. One race. A lost, rebellious race of people. Why is there so much ignorance regarding the last days? Why do we not understand the spirit of Babylon, mm. which drew all mankind together to make a name for themselves, and because we do <coughs> not accept what? In the beginning, the book of Genesis. <clears throat> it's absolutely crucial that we do. And when a church or a group or a preacher departs from a literal understanding and acceptance of the Word of God, a door is opened for what? To be led astray by the serpent. The second thing, <clears throat> getting myself in hot water here. The second thing, and it comes again and again and again, you'll see it in churches. It's how it starts people not believing and not preaching the literal word of God from the pulpit. Stage two women in leadership. Women in leadership. Women in pulpits. Women preaching and teaching in the church. Stage two. The door is now wide open, dear friends, to every deceiving spirit, to every deception, to the evil one. To lead God's people astray. Let's look <clears throat> at one or two scriptures. First Timothy and chapter two. First Timothy First Timothy chapter two. We need to pray for government. It's our responsibility, it's our privilege to do so. God wants all men to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. Verse 8, therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension, 
Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair, gold, or pearls, or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as befits women making a claim to godliness. Let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Why, you misogynist? <clears throat> Why? Because it was not the culture of the day? Why? Well, we're told why, dear friends. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived. Was Adam deceived? Yeah. No. No. The woman, being quite deceived, fell into transgression. But women shall be preserved through the bearing of children yes. if they continue in faith and love and sanctity and self-restraint. Mm -hmm. It's a trustworthy statement. Is it true? Yes, it's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, uncontentious, and free from the love of money. Find me a few if you can. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. If a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, lest he become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. <clears throat> so what is the qualification for oversight in the church? For leadership in the church. Male. It must be male. And those males should be mature. married. They should be mature believers. They should have raised children and instructed their children in the teaching and admonition of the Lord. And the fruit of that should not have been rebellious ungodly, disrespectful children. God says, if you can't teach your own children the word of God, the ways of God, the precepts of God, raise them with that kind of understanding and those principles you will never do it with my children. That's what God is saying. Now is that reasonable? Absolutely. If you cannot maintain a level of discipline and order within your own home, how are you going to do that in the household of God? If you can't do it with your own children, what on earth makes you think that you're going to be able to do it with God's children? Because they're a funny bunch. First Corinthians chapter 14. The passage 
follows on. We've had in chapter 10 something um, of an introduction regarding um, our gathering and uh, remembering the Lord. Mm -hmm. Chapter 11, God sets out a headship. Christ is the head of the man, and the man is the head of the woman. A man should not be covered because he is the image and glory of God. No hats, men in church. A woman should be under the headship of the man. There's a covering, there's a protection, there's an order. Working that out is not easy, but it's there. And it's God's best for every family, for every marriage, for every relationship. Sadly, it's not often found. But you can't be God's best. Then chapters 12 to 14, we have something of instruction regarding gathering and <clears throat> the operation of manifestations of the Spirit. How we should cover the Spirit of God. We should cover the Spirit of God, dear friends. We shouldn't be terrified about the presence and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. He's God. He's a person, the third person of the Godhead, and he means to build up and to bless God's people. Amen. But towards the end of the chapter, we, we see this. Verse 34, let the women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. Let them subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God went forth? Question. Who was entrusted with the word of God in the beginning? In the beginning? Adam. Who did God say? Who did God tell not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? You shall not eat from that tree. The day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. To whom did God entrust the word? To the man. So who was supposed to tell Eve? The man. Was supposed to instruct the woman from the beginning. Has God changed his plan? His order? His purpose? No. It was established in the beginning. The word of God came forth. If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. What's he saying? You've got a problem in the church. You've got people coming up with a revelation. I've got, I've, I've had got a revelation from God. I've had a word from the Lord. And I just feel that God would have me say this. Well, we should all recognize that the word of God has come forth, dear friends, and it is written. And this is our measure for everything. Mm -hmm. The scripture is the measure for everything in the church. Everything in your life, regarding conduct, regarding everything. The way to live righteously and godly is to live according to the Word of God, to understand God's ways, His precepts, His statutes, 
Where does God draw the line on a thing? Mm. What has God told us to do and told us not to do? Praise God, we're saved by grace. Praise God, we have an advocate with the Father. When we fail, when we slip, when we fall short, the blood of Jesus Christ come. <coughs> The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Praise God for that. But the word of God. Now this is not to say that ladies should shut their mouths from the minute that they walk through the door of a church meeting till the day, time that they go home. Because we've already had, in chapter 11, a woman should be covered while praying and prophesying. Yes. So the idea that women shouldn't be praying or prophesying, or worshipping God, or praising Him, or thanking Him in church is just absurd. And I know the Brethren movement have gone down that road, but it's wrong. Blatantly, obviously wrong. So there's a freedom for us all mm. <coughs> within certain limits. Mm. And God has said that leadership, eldership, and the teaching ministry mm. is for men mm. within the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're different, dear friends. <coughs> men and women are different. Mm. Not just physically, not just in purpose physically, I'm never going to have a baby. Why? Because I'm a man. And God made me that way. And I will always be a man, it doesn't matter what I think or what I do to myself. God forbid. <laughs> and ladies, <clears throat> praise God, he's made you the way that he's made you. Yeah. And he's made you to compliment a man. That the two can be joined together and complement one another. But women are more perceptive, they're more sensitive, all kinds of things. God made women to be those who can show that affection and love for children, to nurture, them in the home and, and to provide that, what children need in that sense. And he made men in those big daft lumps who don't have those capabilities. Amen? He's made us different, dear friends. He's made us different. Now there is no guarantee that just because a church has male leadership that it's not going to go astray. But I guarantee you this, if a church has got female leadership, it will. Every time, because a door's been opened for the serpent to deceive. Now any man that doesn't listen to his godly wife in what she is receiving from the Lord is a fool. But the man is specifically made to process that information, to make decisions and to stick to them. Men are stubborn. and I'm sure you haven't noticed that ladies, but I'll just point that one out to you. It's the way God's made us. We're not off with every little feeling and women just... No, we're just... 
oblivious to what's going on around us, our people feel. Got our big size nines and tens on, we're forever putting our foot in it, <coughs> but not easily moved and swayed. Amen? <laughs> And so when a man knows the truth revealed to him through the word of God, by the spirit of God, he's not letting go of that easily. And it doesn't matter what some person's <coughs> feeling or coming up with. And there's a security in that. Do you understand? Women are much more spiritually sensitive than males. They are. Much more perceptive of, of God's leading and of, of what God is doing in a, in a, in a meetings and, and things like that. Much more. Mm -hmm. And praise God for that. But the balance to that is big daft men. To keep things on a level keel. Especially auction. <laughs> <coughs> Daffodils to the lot. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it, or touch it lest you die. Now did God say that? No. No. She's just thrown a bit extra in. She's opened the door to the serpent. For God knows. <clears throat> the serpent says, you surely shall not die. God's not going to judge you. Just for eating an apple. Or a bit of fruit, whatever it is. A nice pomegranate. Don't know what fruit was on the tree, do we? No. You shall not die. God knows. In the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Mm -hmm. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves loin covering. What happened? Well, <clears throat> the first thing is they began to throw doubt on what God had said. The serpent will always seek to throw doubt on what God has said. Has God really said that? And when the evil one can get us questioning what God has said, <coughs> he's halfway there. Mm. We must accept all scripture. All scripture is inspired, God breathed, and is profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for rebuke. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God should be perfect, fully 
equipped, adequate for every good work and service. Is there anything outside of this book that we need? No. Doctrinally? Mm -hmm. No. It's all in here somewhere. We might need to search, mm -hmm. but it's all in here. The ways of God, the purposes of God, the character of God, what God likes, what God doesn't like. Mm -hmm. We need to know His ways, we need to understand God's ways that we might know Him. <clears throat> it's a relationship. Mm. When two people are married, they get to know the other person's ways, <laughs> don't they? Mm. <clears throat> they know what they like and what they don't like. They know how to wind them up and infuriate them. Why? Because they know their ways. We need to know the ways of God. So that if someone comes and says, oh, I just saw God doing this. Well, that doesn't sound right. How do we know that doesn't sound right? Because we know His ways. We know the kinds of things that God does. The way that He's acted with His children for centuries. We know His ways, so we know Him. If you, you, you know, if someone came and said, I've just seen your spouse down the high street, they're doing so and so, do you think, oh, okay. my wife, my husband would never do that. I don't know who you've seen, but it wasn't them. Because you know their ways. Well, it's the same with God. We need to understand his ways. Israel saw God's deeds. Mm. But Moses knew his ways. Mm. Knew his character knew the way that he walked, fought, and the, the things that pleased him and displeased him. We need to understand that. Where does it come from? Reading through the scriptures, day by day by day, and understanding the ways of God. <clears throat> so, where does it go from there? The devil holds out the rather enticing thought that there's a way of wisdom and understanding which doesn't come directly from God. Hmm? You'll find it in eating a piece of fruit. You'll find it in the watchtower. They've got special revelation for you from God. You find it in the Pope. You get it from the Pope. When he puts his special hat on, he always gets it right. <coughs> you go to the Apostle, the Prophet, the man of God. He'll tell you. He'll have special insight and wisdom from God. Charismatics, the Catholics, the cults, they've all got their individuals, their organization, their book or whatever mm -hmm. to give you revelation from God outside of what's in the scripture. We can't go down that route, dear friends. What do you need? You need to know the Word of God. And you need the Holy Spirit. You need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the Helper <coughs> will lead you into all truth. all truth. All truth. You don't need that new book by so and so to understand it all. Do you understand? Call no man teacher. One is your teacher. We should always be looking to him to teach us, to lead us into all truth and searching the scriptures to look and find things in the word of God. What else? Special groups <clears throat> of spiritual ones. You'll be like 
God, knowing good and evil, you'll know it all. We'll have the priest with his special frock on. He's the man that you need to go to. He'll tell you. Maybe it's not somebody called a priest. Maybe it's the apostle or the prophet, the man of God. You've got to go to them because they're the ones who have the understanding. They're the ones who will give you the word from God. The house church movement, it was the, the leaders. Mm. The, you, you, had, you had to go to your house group leader. You had to go to your whatever. And he was going to tell you how to run your life. Yeah. What's that? Deception. It's deception. It's deception. And it was there from the beginning. Nothing new under the sun. And how did they fall? Well, three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Are any of us susceptible to that? Yes. Yes, we are, dear friends. And we should be ever mindful of it. Men especially should be mindful of the lusts of the flesh and the pride of life. Yeah. Many a church has gone wrong when pride gets into the leadership yeah. and they start thinking that they are somebody or whatever. We need to watch for these things. And last but certainly not least. God said, the day you eat from it, what? you shall surely die. Not lest you die, you will surely die. There is a certainty about God punishing sin. It's not what he might do, dear friends. There is a certainty about God judging sin. And we don't want to preach it. So we come with another gospel. God's the answer to that vacuum in your life. God's the answer to your drug problem or your alcohol problem or your mental health problem. God's the answer, he's the healer for this, that and the other. No, dear friends, the problem is that God must judge sin. God will judge sin. And that's why we need a saviour. Because the only acceptable sacrifice that there is for our sins is that Jesus was made sin and was judged in our place. Praise God for Jesus. Amen. Praise God for Calvary. Amen. Yes. You shall certainly die. You surely die. The wages of sin is death. death. But praise God that Jesus died in our place so that we can be forgiven. That we can have the gift of eternal life in Watch out that you don't open the door for the evil one to lead astray. There's nothing new under the sun. These things were laid out from the beginning. He doesn't really have a plan B, he's just the same. God doesn't have a plan B because he's the same mm. yesterday, today and forever mm. do not be misled keep to the word of God 
keep to the precepts, the principles that is laid out for us clearly in Scripture, once and for all delivered to us, and praise God for Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for that instruction. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for what we've looked at today, Lord. Would you help us to understand these things, to lay hold on them? <clears throat> Father, where we, we see people being led astray, where we see uh, different ones opening the door to him who would lead them astray, would deceive them. Lord, help us, as Paul said, to be jealous with a godly jealousy for the body of Christ. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.